Oh, man. <sighs> Guys, it is a bloody battlefield out there, and I am so glad to be inside. Today, we continue on our trilogy review series with Resistance 2. Almost 12 years ago to this day, I finished this game, and it left me with a lot of mixed emotions. And I hear you ask, Russ, what are these mixed emotions? Well, you're just going to have to join me playing this game and seeing what my thoughts are after all this time. So let's get in and review Resistance 2. Resistance 2 begins right where we left off in the first title. We find our struggling war hero Nathan Howell being ambushed by a special forces group. Like Nathan, they are infected by the Chimeran virus. The members in the special forces unit keep themselves in check by a thing called an inhibitor. Basically like insulin shots that keep the virus from spreading throughout their body. Because in 2020, I need another bloody virus to be worried about. Before Nathan has any time to rest, his ugly old mates the Camaro begin their assault on the helicopter and it's not long before they begin descending fast into the ground below. Once Nathan comes around, surviving a crash in a helicopter of all things, we get our first look at the game. Now, I didn't want to start this early talking about graphics, but it must be said, this is something I noticed straight away. A great improvement over the original title with the environment showing a lot more details, the enemies and allies get a good facelift, and the guns looking more polished. You could really tell that Insomniac Games were starting to get their head around the PS3's hardware, especially in the area of graphics. One thing about the PS3, it was very well known that it was a hard console to develop games on. As we continue our way through the opening levels, we meet our main antagonist of the game, Daedalus, formerly known as Jordan Adam in his previous human form. Daedalus is a human mutation of an experiment that went wrong during Project Abraham from being injected with DNA of pure Chimeran. Nathan was also exposed to this same experiment, but up to this point had managed to hold back the mutation. Of course, Daedalus escapes and begins his primary focus on activating Chimeran towers scattered through the US and the world. Shortly after the three cutscenes, we find two years has passed and Nathan has been promoted to the rank of Lieutenant. He has been given the command of his new team named the Echo Squad. The Echo Squad with Nathan battle the way through many enemies and bosses over the course of the game to arrive at their final destination. But we'll talk more on the game's ending later on in the review. When it comes to the gameplay of Resistance 2, this is where I found a number of good changes, but at the same time, disappointments over the previous title. One big improvement was now, after taking damage, health auto regenerated. Unlike the first title, where at times I found myself super frustrated due to the fact of not being able to find a medipack and feeling stuck. Now for my first major problem, the Resistance series has always been well known for its great sci-fi futuristic guns, but unfortunately, Resistance 2 suffered the same fate as many modern shooters of its time. Around the time of Halo 3, almost every first person shooter began limiting how many guns you could carry. The original Resistance gave us a wheel of guns to select from, but with the Resistance 2, it was limited to just two. In order to switch out guns, you had to pick them up across the battlefield. I mean, when there's 12 guns in the game and you can only choose two at a time, it kind of sucks. And I hear you saying, but Russ, two guns is more realistic. And I hear you, but, you know, the Resistance series was never meant to be realistic. It's not meant to be like Call of Duty. It's meant to be unrealistic and fun. And I want more guns, goddammit. So stop taking my fun away from me. The other great thing about having a wheel of guns to choose from was it gave the game a bit more of a strategy element. We've been able to choose the right gun for the task ahead. While on the topic of guns, we do see some new guns. A few standard ones for me were the Marksman, a fun sniper rifle with a secondary fire that creates balls of lightning with projectiles that move through the air, zapping enemies. We also had the V7 Splicer, a gun that shoots big ass discs out to cut up even the biggest enemies, which was kind of fun in small doses. Like 
The last standout gun for me was the HVAP, or High Velocity Armor Piercing, a fully automatic gun with capabilities of firing 1200 rounds per minute, with an interesting fact of being the first infusion of human and Camaran tech. I can't tell you how satisfying it was using the gun to wipe out huge hordes of enemies in just a matter of seconds. A lot of enemies from the first title maker are 10 and we meet some of the new ones like the Carmelians. These sneaky buggers are invisible until they're right in front of you. If you're not on your toes, they will kill you in one quick swipe. Up ahead. You guys aren't going to believe what I ah! In levels where your path is surrounded by water, we have the Furies, which to me looked like a blended up mix of half mermaid and a bloody crocodile. Basically, anywhere there is water, you can expect the Fury to be lurking. Another new enemy, the Grims, provided me a lot of fun. In some areas, there is a lot of them, and I mean, there is a fucking lot of them. At times, it was like I was in a zombie apocalypse run and gun type title. They were just coming out everywhere, and I just had to just plaster them with bullets in order to get past the areas. Seeing these enemies hatch from eggs, just terrifying, with grenades definitely being your friend against these ugly enemies. One enemy that annoyed me the most was the bloody drones. Man, I found them just annoying and at times just a big bloody time waster. Like, come on, just let me continue. Nothing fun about these at all. And then we get up to the boss levels, and let me tell you, there's a few good ones, but then some of the worst bosses I've ever come up against in my life. The first boss we come up against in San Francisco of all places is Kraken, a big ass sea monster who has no time for making friends. The design of this boss I really like, it looks just great and it's quite satisfying to kill. It provides a good amount of challenge, but at the same time, isn't too hard to kill. The second boss, oh, this is a good one, guys. The huge ass spider called the Mother Spinner provides a fun battle on a defense tower. No bug spray is going to be effective here, just raining it with bullets whenever it opens its mouth is the key to victory. I don't know about you, but there's just something I find so fun and satisfying when it comes to a spider boss. It always reminds me of the first time against the spider boss in Final Fantasy VIII. Oh, those were good times. The boss of Swarm was a huge pain in my ass. As soon as I saw this boss, I was like, oh, for fuck's sake. As I remember this boss being a huge pain in my ass many years back. This boss, like a swarm of killer man-eating bees, can't be killed by bullets or even slowed down. Even while sprinting, the swarm can outrun you. If the swarm touches you, you're fucked. Trust me when I say this, you're going to die over and over again. This boss level is pure lazy. Rather than being fun, it's basically a puzzle level which I always hate in games. Only by trial and error you work out the ideal path to victory. You eventually beat it with luring it into an electric generator, trapping it and shooting it with a cannon. But you have to do this in three stages. You have no chances to mess up here, as if you die at any stage in this battle, you have to restart from the beginning. No checkpoints here. The fourth major boss, Leviathan, was amazing to look at. It reminded me of Godzilla stomping through the city, destroying everything in its path. Unfortunately, this boss was essentially a big quick time event, with you having to shoot at the correct moment. You end the boss's life by shooting down a bridge to make an ugly hole in its face. From there, you simply shoot the hole to take it out. I feel this boss could have been given a lot more thought. Then the story continues with Nathan's squad shutting down the town network. That success is shortly lived though, as it's quickly overridden by Daedalus, and the entire tower system boots back up. Time passes and Nathan is looking very sick. He isn't far from turning full-blown Chimeran. Nathan is faced with two options of either saving himself 
or going after an inhibitor. Nathan puts humankind first and begins his new assignment of making his way onto the Chimeran flagship. Nathan's squad are assigned with a nuclear bomb. The goal of the bomb is to place it inside the main tower and have it wipe out the entire network and Chimeran army. Nathan's squad make it onto the flagship with the bomb, but before long, they are killed off by the Chimera. Nathan finds himself all alone, trying to chase down the bomb before the Chimera push the bomb off the ship. For the final boss of the game, we go up against Daedalus. The first stage of the battle begins with Daedalus ripping off the roof panels. In the beginning, I was shooting him, but found you could basically just walk away from his attacks while waiting to progress to the next room. Once you get through all three rooms, you can move to the platform. Just remember not to die here, because you'll have to do this all over again. Once you reach the platform, you go into a confined room against an angry Daedalus. Doing your best to avoid his attacks, all you need to do is shoot the lit up points on the pillars. The points help you fire electric current straight through Daedalus. Do this a few times and that's it, Daedalus dies. Are you fucking serious? That's how the final boss of the game dies. Really? I mean, we had the fucking swarm boss of all bosses that was just an absolute pain in my ass to a point I wanted to break my controller. And then we have the final boss, Daedalus, who is just wiped out in seconds after all this hype across the whole game leading up to finally going up against him. You know, I was so excited to go in there and have this epic hard battle against him, but it's over within a matter of minutes. It was almost like Insomniac Games was just like, you know what, we're at the end of the game, don't really care, let's just make him easy and then move on and grab the cash. <laughs> That's what it seems like. It's just really disappointing for a final boss. With that anger at the way, the final part of the story has Nathan approach Daedalus, absorbing his power. From this, Nathan, now fully Chimera, and takes on a new godlike ability. As soon as Nathan throws up his hands, enemies explode. Nothing in our path can stop us now. Nathan makes his way through to a waiting spacecraft just before the major nuke explosion. The explosion wipes out the entire Chimera tower network, crippling the enemy. The ship gets caught on the edge of the explosion, sending them into the ground below. Nathan's fellow comrade finds that Nathan has turned fully Chimeran and has no choice but to kill Nathan, ending the Chimeran rise, or did he? This is just the beginning. Forgive me, sir. It was an honor. With all that being said, we come to the final verdict of this game, Resistance 2. And it's hard to say this, but I have to give it a 6 out of 10. With all the hype that I had from the first title, I was super excited to play this, but unfortunately fell a little bit short of my expectations. When you had a look at the story elements of the game, the, it, was, it was just weak, and at times it was confusing. We had the parts with the guns where... I just felt like I really wanted that wheel of guns. I didn't want to have to be picking up guns along the way. And then also the boss battles, which are always a huge thing to me, especially with a story-driven game like Resistance 2, where you know there was the quick time events, there was bosses that made really no sense, and then right at the end, making the final boss uber easy just wasn't for me. So unfortunately, Resistance 2 gets a 6 out of 10. In the coming weeks guys, we'll be continuing on with our review trilogy series of Resistance with Resistance 3. And oh boy, am I excited for this one guys. Like Resistance 2, I cannot wait to see how my views have changed over the years and just reliving that excitement. If you're looking to support the channel in any way, you can do that by clicking on the Teespring link that's in the description and buying some of the cool merchandise that's there or you can become one of the fellow Gundy Russ members on YouTube by clicking the membership button. Alright guys, don't forget to leave me a big thumbs up, and as always, don't forget to subscribe, fools. See you later.